everyone and welcome to Medhead Asnur Podcast, Season 2, Episode 15. I'm your host, Vika Slanyan, and as always, I'm joined by my amazing co-host, Mike Balian. It is Thursday, April 28th, 2022. Happy Thursday to everyone. It is one day closer to the weekend. Um, our episode today is going to be the history of Armenia in the 6th century. Um, this is something different that we're doing this time, which is going to be, uh, recording live while we're going to be, we typically do this while we're, you know, we read off camera, off camera yeah. talk about it. So we thought we do something different, you know, um, uh, we wanted to show you guys what we do, how this whole works. Spice some so things up. it's going to be something fun and interesting, right? Yeah. All right. Well, um, before we start reading topic um i suggest you move your paper so you're not in my camera shot we are next to one another so it's kind of weird but we wanted to do it like this so you guys see us um let's see what's going on oh last episode man without a poppy on how, how cool was that you know yeah yeah he was a cool guy he was a cool guy yeah. we had a great conversation it was really interesting I, I i know i know both of us have been really interested in the uh you know uh woodrow wilson's map in general what it was about and I think I learned a lot about it. You know, things that we it never crossed our mind. Man, he just he just flows. Yeah. Like the guy wouldn't stop talking. And yeah. I mean, I mean, in a good way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like it just even in English, it just went information, 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 yeah. information. Yeah. It's awesome. I uh, honestly, I wish we had more time with him. Uh, there were so many. I mean, we had questions prepared for him, and you know, but uh, as he was talking, so many more questions were coming in our heads yeah. and we're just like, yeah, I don't think, I don't think holding back almost the, the questions we had prepared for him. I think half of them, we didn't even ask because yeah. it just flowed with the conversation, yep. which is great. Yeah. yeah. Which is yeah. great. It was great. So if you haven't seen that episode, go back, look at it. Uh, actually we had, uh, we re aired it on uh, last Saturday as well um so i think everybody would like it so if you haven't seen it go back and watch episode 14th with ara papian um uh, those of you who have been ordering the sculptures thank you so much we appreciate it um and uh those of you who are trying to make a deal with us please stop <laughs> uh we appreciate the support but we're not selling this out of our uh, trunk of our Garage. oldsmobile yeah uh and you know um proceeds do go to miasin.org um and and you know we're already giving people a great deal if you buy two you get a free t-shirt and a bug so again um we know a lot of you out there spend 200 dollars on stupid things so if you want to spend that on this don't try to make a deal with us um but <laughs> we appreciate the support um but yeah anything else you want to mention before we start um no i mean i'm sure we'll flow into it all right Maybe. okay okay perfect well, uh, so today's topic, like I said, it's the history of Armenia in the sixth century, and oh, I do have something to say. Oh, okay, I'm I'm excited that we're doing this. You know, the I lives are awesome. Yeah, but God, I love the history yeah. part of it. Yeah. I oh, really do. I do want to mention um, those of you who will be listening this to, to later on on your podcast platform. Uh, we are pre-recording this. Uh, in a video format as well and we'll be airing it live while, while you're watching this right now we will be live in the chat room with you so if you have questions go ahead and ask us and we'll answer it but this is pre-recorded airing live on youtube okay so, so you get to see our ugly faces yeah, for yeah an hour hour and a half yeah something like that so all right so back to the topic again the history of armenia in the sixth century now a lot of the stuff does take during the byzantine empire uh, there's a lot of the stuff that we're going to read and discuss does take place with the uh, Romans and the Sasanians. As always. Yeah, as always. So, to begin, in the beginning of the 6th century, Armenia was divided between the Byzantine and Sasanian empires. The western, relatively smaller portion of Armenia was within the boundaries of the Byzantine, while the central and eastern portions of Armenia were within the Sasanian empire. As we had mentioned in our previous episodes, uh, the portion of Armenia, which was within the jurisdiction of the Sasanian Empire and was known as the Marspanate of Armenia, had enjoyed a great deal of autonomy and was local, locally ruled by the Armenian Nahadars. Their rights were recognized by the Persian Shahs according to the Treaty of Navarsak of 484 that came 
about a result of the Armenian national liberation struggle during the Vartanans and the Vahanans wars of the 5th century. Time of turmoil. Let's see what yeah. happens. I want to mention something about this. Yeah. Uh, you know, we when you posted that that uh, rendering of Vartan Mami Konya, oh, yeah. um, you know, uh, we, we had a certain somebody who wanted to, uh, you know, <laughs> made some claims that Vartan Mami Konya is celebrating a lo- losers. Yeah, loser and this and that. Um, to those of you who think this way, um, and and you know, I, I didn't get involved in that conversation, but uh, it really bothered me. And I want to I want to express that right now. What he fought for at that time was their belief and what they wanted, which was the freedom of to practice their religion, to be left alone. And even though he died on the battlefield, uh, what he did took another thirty years for his nephew which was during the Vahanans war, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, to actually be able to accomplish this for the Persians to leave us alone, basically. Yeah. So for him to die on the battlefield, if that makes him a loser, I, I, I don't know how to so respond then, to that. So then I'm going to say this. I might get skewered for this, but you know what? The hell with it. I'm going to be bold about it. So if Vartan's a loser, that means Antranik Pasha's a loser. Mm-hmm. That means Garigin Nujde is a loser. That means... They're all losers, yeah. right? According yeah. to what this individual had to say. Yeah, because they didn't they didn't get to accomplish so, what they wanted. You know. So careful how you pick <clears throat> your w- fights, your battles, whatever the yeah. case is, because yeah. you're throwing all of this into the mix. Yeah. Do some research, read history before you understand you the sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So, anyways, moving on. Sorry about the rant, oh, but it's I fine. had to. It's know. okay. In the early 6th century, the Marspanet of Armenia was ruled locally by Marspan Vart Mamikonyan, the younger brother of Vahan Mamikonyan. Vart ruled Armenia from 506 to 510 AD. During this period, the capital of Armenia had remained the city of Devin. It is noteworthy to mention that during this time, the neighboring churches of Iberia and Albania were to a great extent subordinate to the Holy See of Echmiadzin which was indicative of the strong Armenian cultural and spiritual influence throughout the region. Earlier, Mesrop Mashtots had devised Iberian and Albanian alphabets, which further strengthened the bonds and Armenian influence throughout these neighboring lands. Yeah. The education was spreading. Yep. As we had mentioned in our previous episode on the history of the Vahanans War, the Shah of Iran, Kavad I who succeeded Balash in 488 and ruled Iran until 531, during the first half of the 6th century, was engulfed with the Byzantines in a series of bloody and prolonged wars. The first of these devastating wars was the Anastasian War, lasting from 502 to 506 AD. Unfortunately, Armenia was the main theater of war during the ensuing bloody Byzant- byzantine sasanian conflict. Yeah. As we've mentioned before, it yeah. was interesting to see that our lands were um, where this these bloody series of battles for a long time, by the way, and we'll get into yeah. that, took place. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if, if you haven't, if you haven't uh, listened to those two episodes, the, the uh, Vartanans, Vartanans War and, and the Vahanans War, go listen to it. I mean, we, uh, we talk about... It's information heavy, yeah. but... It's very uh, the details of the war and what took place yeah. uh, that would help you a lot to to kind of have a visual of of what took place. But you know th- we're going to mention this a lot. Ar- Armenia at that time, when we talk about being the theater uh, of war during, I mean it's just one battle after battle in the you know um, basically right in the center of Armenia. Yeah, you know? yeah. Now yeah. you know what the interesting thing is about this. And I found it interesting. I've, uh, you know, I've actually poked fun at this a little bit, and I shouldn't, but still, it's noteworthy. Is that the historians and um, who were kind of on the sidelines taking notes yeah. of the battles? Yeah. Right. Yeah. God bless them. <laughs> Without them, we wouldn't have this. Yeah. And thankfully, they were either protected or <laughs> whatever the case is. We're going to yeah. get into that in a yeah. little bit, but. God bless them, because yeah. we wouldn't have this information. Yeah, I no agree. joke. I agree. No joke. Well, uh, in 502, Kavat I began the hostilities against the Byzantines by attacking the western portion of Armenia, which were under the Byzantine rule. The same year, Kavat captured the Armenian city of Karin. 
the next Armenian towns to be captured by Kabat's troops throughout 502 to 503 were Silvan and Amid in the Athring province of Armenia. The Byzantine emperor Anastasius I, who ruled from 491 to 518 in order to check Sasanian advance, dispatched troops in May of 503. The Byzantine army was the largest Roman force in the east since Julian's invasion of Persia in the 4th century. The force gathered at the Armenian towns of Edessa and Samosata. It operated in three divisions under Magister Militum per Orientem. Jeez, at these words, man. Or the supreme military commander of the east. Ariobindus, with generals Partisius and Hypatius, serving as his deputies. Hypatius and Partisius attacked Amid, which was held by a 3,000-strong garrison. Ariobindus attacked the Armenian town of Metzbin, known as Nisibis in Greek and Roman sources, where Kavat I was personally staying. Another thing that needs to be mentioned is we got, we're trying, well, I don't know about you, but I got really good at my Latin <laughs> you this. did yes going over the yeah. notes the last couple days i got really good with my latin hopefully. i'm still struggling with these words <laughs> man. hopefully i don't, <laughs> hopefully I don't mess it up but yeah yeah yes we took some latin <laughs> lessons in this <laughs> <laughs> oh and man initially ario bindis gained the upper hand in Matsbin, but kavat the first counterattack defeated him the sasanian shah's army plundered the fort Ap apadna and forced ario bindis to return to, to retreat westward. Hippatius and Patricius attempted to assist him, but it was too late. They failed to join with Ariobindus and were decisively defeated between the towns of Apadna and Tel Beshme and retreated to Samosata. According to the chronicler Zacharias, their cavalry suffered hev heavily during the retreat, falling from the cliffs of the mountains. Interesting way to go. Kavad, Isn't that a scene from uh <laughs> it's a scene from like a lot of movies <laughs> it is it sure is some good cg action man yeah kavad continued westward to costantia but failed to capture it even though he received supplies from his inhabitants he got help and he still failed in early september kavad reached near edessa Ariobindus rejected kavad the first demand of ten thousand pounds or 4500 kilograms of gold a lot yeah in exchange for peace byzantine forces under ferris manis attacked amid and killed the sasanian commander glonis who was defending the town now um i want to apologize ahead of time for all the names we're probably yeah gonna butcher. yeah we're, we're um but yeah it's it's uh, latin it's a learning process yes it is yes, yes it is this together with the hunnic insertion the arrival of the Byzantine reinforcements and Kavat the first lack of supplies forced him to withdraw to Persia. This further contributed to the reputation of Edessa as being impregnable. In November of 506, a treaty was finally agreed, but little is known of what the terms of the treaty were. The 6th century Byzantine historian Procopius states that peace was agreed for seven years. Odd number, huh? Seven mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And it is likely that some payments were made to the Persians. Might have been some sort of symbolic thing. Yeah. Well, definitely some, some money was exchanged, right? The Persians did not keep Byzantine territory and no annual tributes was paid. So it, so it seems the peace treaty was not harsh on the Byzantines. Thus, by 506, the Anastasian War, named after Emperor Anastasius, came to an end. Unfortunately as, a, unfortunately, as a result of the war, many of the Armenian cities, towns, and villages were devastated. Yeah. Well, you know, that's what normally happens during war, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that's, again, it, it's, it's being in the middle of, like, we're the battlefield. You know, everything just happened there, for, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, it's like, know. well, we don't want our lands ruined. Well, we don't yeah. want our lands ruined. Why don't we just fight there in Armenia? Seriously, right? Yeah. Now, between 515 and 516, several Hunnic tribes kept making insurgents into Armenia. Nahar, Naharar Mejej. Uh, Ganuni organized a counterattack and successfully drove the invaders out of Armenia. As a reward, the grateful Kavad I recognized Mezhej as the Marspan of Armenia in 518. 
In 527, Mezes once again repelled several of the Hunnic invasions. Mezes governed Armenia for around 30 years until 548. Um, I, I don't know much about him. Uh, I, I would really like to learn. I, well, I don't know if there's information <clears throat> about him. Well, I'm sure in this venture forward, we're, we're definitely going to be handpicking quite a few of these individuals. That's what I'm saying too. is like, I would love to uh, basically, if we can, for example, you know, pick him, if there is information about him, do an episode just about him, what he did in those, you know, battles and... Yeah, I'd be curious because, I mean, I know we're heading into a time time era right now, the next few centuries, so to speak, where there wasn't too much detailed information, not as much as there was, let's say, in, you know, the first century BC into the third and fourth century AD, yeah. right? Yeah. That, yeah. that was, that, as we know, was super information heavy yeah. Yeah. because you had so many historians and and philosophers and whatnot writing down the events of everything that was going on with the roman empire the greek empire the the parthians the sasanians yeah and on and on and on yeah. and on and on right very information heavy yeah yeah um in 527 a.d emperor justinian the first rose on the byzantine throne and and ruled the empire until 565 a.d his reign is marked by the ambitious but only partly realized Renovatio Imperi, or quote unquote, the restoration of the Roman Empire. See, how was my Latin? How there was you my, go. How Good was job, my, buddy. I'm Proud trying. Of you. I'm trying. This ambition was expressed by the partial recovery of the territories of the former Western Roman Empire. His general, Balisarius, swiftly conquered the Vandal Kingdom in North Africa. Subsequently, Belisarius and the renowned Armenian general Nerses Kamsarakan conquered the Ostrogothic kingdom, restoring Dalmatia, Sicily, Italy, and Rome to the empire after more than half a century of rule by the Ostrogoths. The Praetorian perfect Liberius reclaimed the south of the Iberian Peninsula, encompassing modern Spain, establishing the province of Spania. These campaigns reestablished Roman control over the Western Mediterranean, incre increasing the empire's annual revenue by over a million solidi. Wow. I actually looked up to see what the... I know you did. <laughs> <laughs> I know you did. There's I had to, man. I mean, look, we're talking about some sort of like monetary system made out of gold. So all what said, is it, Mikey? All it said was solidi was uh, the equivalent of four and a half grams of solid the highest grade gold they had at the time, okay? And there have been plenty of coins that have been found, uh, but, but, so it didn't, but it didn't give an equivalent of like what, let's say, it would be worth yeah, in, what it in would be dollars worth. today, okay. right? Um, that's one thing I came to a roadblock to, but hey, million okay. solidi, right? I'd like some million solidi. I want a million solidi. I mean, imagine yeah. you have a million of four and a half grams of gold. I'll pay you one solidi today. <laughs> I'll take it <laughs> for a hamburger. <laughs> I'll take How it. Does that, does, that, does that does that have a number one? Oh, combo I gladly pay you once a lady Tuesday for a hamburger today. <laughs> oh man! Anyway, moving on. Remember Popeye, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, all right. <laughs> During his reign, Justinian also subdued the Tani, a people on the east coast of the Black Sea that had never been under Roman rule before. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. They never really went to that yeah. to that side. They couldn't get there. So we're going to talk about a lot about Nerses, uh, yes, and, we are. and and everything that he did, and you know, being a great Armenian general. So uh, Justinian also fought with the Sasanian Empire in the east during Kavat the first reign, and later again during the Shah Khosrow first reign. This second conflict was partially initiated due to his ambitions in the west. Um, they they all had ambitions in the West. You yeah, know? but the Romans the uh, I forgot was it Alexander the Great that went the furthest east? Yeah, it yeah, was he, right. He, yeah, yeah, he was with, the one. yeah, if you look at if he you went look all the at way any to of the like old Mongolia or no, uh, did he no, go to no, India? No, no, no. He conquered a lot of from what if my memory serves me right. He conquered quite a bit of the of what's known as iran now but i think that's the biggest it extended really we to gotta look east. that up i thought he I went all the way i think uh, don't quote me like on it but I f if i re recall correctly from just like old roman territorial yeah. maps or whatnot i don't know we'll look it up all right or, or you guys look but it they up could, but, know, they could never, but they could never but they never could really budge through yeah. or get through the persians they yeah. just couldn't yeah let us know in the chats uh, like i said we're gonna be live yeah. with you guys in the chat so let us know maybe we're wrong we gotta look this up 
So uh, from his uncle and previous Byzantine Emperor Justine, Emperor Justinian inherited ongoing hostilities with the Sasanian Empire. Unfortunately, once again, Armenia was the main theater of war during the hostilities. Yeah, once again. Mm -hmm. In 530, the Persian forces suffered a double defeat at the Armenian towns of Dara and Satala. But the next year saw the defeat of Roman forces on the Belisirius near Callinicium in Syria. However, the 92-year-old Shah Kavad I passed away on September 13th, 531, and his son Khosrov I, who became the next Shah of Iran, decided to end the war by concluding the peace treaty with the Emperor Justinian. So we've got an Armenian named individual becoming mm. the Shah of Persia. But he's not Armenian. I know. Yeah. But it's, 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 yeah. Khosrov. Yeah. 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 And there's a prelude to things to come. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> now, throughout the 530s, Justinian focused much of his attention in trying to reconquer part of Western Roman Empire that were lost in the 5th century to various Germanic tribes. In this objective, one of his most outstanding generals was Nerses Kamsarakan, who in the 550s liberated Rome and other parts of Italy and became the last Roman ruler of Italy. Yeah. Um, but, but it's funny that going back to, you know, the son, Hosrov, trying to basically make peace, you know, he was kind of tired of seeing his dad, I guess, go through all the battles back and forth yeah i mean it, it'll it'll de definitely take its toll on it for after what decade after decade yeah right yeah struggles yeah, yeah. um we're going to be talking a lot about nurses yeah you know, yeah the, the, i think the that. next quite a few pages is going to be pretty much about him as early as 538 justinian dispatched general nurses to italy in order to help his other general belisarius i like the sound of that general nurses I mean, what, general of a Roman Empire, more or less? I mean, that's not a joke. I mean, of course it's not a joke. Nerses, by this time, was already the head of the Imperial Guard and the Grand Chamberlain of the Byzantine Empire. Um, that's a pretty big, like, uh, position, I guess. Grand Chamberlain? I've never heard anything like that. What would, what would, that, what would that kind of necessitate? Yeah, what do you guys think that is? I, 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 Grand, I don't know. What, Imperial, what level gu Imperial Guard, understandable. We've heard that forever with, like, movies and, you know, and, you know the, the Guard of the Empire. Yeah. But Grand Chamberlain, what... what I, I, did, I, I didn't bother looking at yeah, it. Somebody look it up, please. Let us yes, know. Yes, please. Nerses's army arrived in June of 538, probably in Ancona, Italy, consisted of roughly 7,000 soldiers. Many of Nerses' senior officers and soldiers were Armenian. Nerses met with General Belisarius at Firmum, where a council of war was held. The latter was already carrying out a campaign in Italy, but his advance against the Ostrogoths, who were ruling Italy during this time, had stalled. Nerses was recalled to Constantinople by the emperor. However, only to return to Italy in 551 to finish the military campaign against the Ostrogoths. Who were the Ostrogoths? They were they were basically from the north. I think they were like a Gen Germanic tribe. They were Germanic. Yeah, tribe. yeah, okay. yeah. And they were they were the ones who basically came close to almost sacking Rome, but didn't. I see. So, okay. um, yeah. All right. Good knowledge, Mikey. Well, it was during this time that Nerses was to achieve his greatest victories. Germanius, a cousin of the emperor, was appointed by Justinian to finish what Belisarius had started a decade before. However, on his way to Italy in 550, Germanius fell ill and abruptly reached the term of his life. Nerses was appointed the new commander of the army, given supreme command and returned to Italy, where 12 years previously he had been recalled. You know, thinking about this, there is a show on Netflix... That talk that is all about the Roman emperors, and there's a there's one that would talks about uh, Germanius. I'm sure, but there's I don't think there's anything mentioned about Nerses. Of course there isn't. Why would there be? I'm just thinking about it right now. It's 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 weird. I don't know. Hmm. I, I gotta know, go back and look. You know, just a fair warning. Anything that's in Hollywood when it says it's based on a true story. 
Remember those words. Well, it's like a. It's based on a true story. They well, can they can include one little snippet of a five hundred year span and call it based on a true story. Well, no, sorry to kill it for you guys. No, but no, but true. what I'm saying is like it was uh, it was like a documentary movie. Like there's actually historians talking, and then they, there's movie scenes that are shot like really well and stuff. But I don't know why. Like you know, it it, it goes out. It actually. Go, starts with Julius Caesar and then goes on and on and on. Talks about so is it, a sp- is it is it about a specific time era or yeah is yeah it yeah it goes it's all about Rome and and their Caesars and generals and things like that and there is a one that is about uh, Germanius and and his life and his death and everything but nothing about Nurses well, is mentioned in there. Thing, I know I, I one, could be wrong. One right? thing you want to look into though is remember they used a lot of the same names for their sons like. Germanicus, Germanus, that could be too. whatever, that could be too. Octavius, yeah. yada, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. They, they used to recycle these names quite often. Yeah. I mean, again, I just, I don't know, it popped in my head, so I could be wrong. So anyways, um, Nerses amassed anywhere between twenty to 30,000 troops. He seemed to be well-liked by many of the soldiers, as according to the contemporary historians, he had treated them especially well. Procopius reported that Nerses had built an imp- impressive army that in the requirement of men and arms was worthy of the Roman Empire. The army reflected many of Nerses's previous commands in that the core of his army was made up of Armenian troops. Of course Armenian, it was. Armenians and they stick together and they're and one of the, the best Ro- warriors the out there. Roman Empire. Yeah. 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 Nerses was to take more than a year to reach Italy after his appointment as his entire army made a long march along the coast of the Adriatic Sea. Totila, remember this name, the Ostrogothic king, controlled the sea of eastern Italy and hampered supply ships that set sail for Nerses's army. Byzantine general John from Salona led 38 ships, and General Valerian sailed with 12 of his to meet Totila's force and bring relief to the town of Ancona. Procopius described the subsequent battle of Sena Gallica as a naval battle that resembled a battle on land. Now, Procopius is the individual that um, would, must have stood on the sidelines and yeah. took notes. He just drew. Thank you, <laughs> sir. Thank you. <laughs> drew, I'm drawing all of that? That'd be, that would be... Perched gar- on a stone. Gar- just gargantuan watching. task. Yeah. Anyway, in his writings, he quotes, There were arrows discharged and fighting at close quarters with sword and spear, just as on, b- on a battlefield. The Byzantine victory at Sena Gallica was overwhelming as 36 of the 47 Gothic ships were destroyed. Wow. Yeah, that's a bad percentage. And Gibal, a Gothic admiral, was captured. Historian Archibald R. Lewis pointed out that victory could only come to Nersas after Totila's sea dominance was brought to an end. I would say it did. There were a number of reasons that Nerses's march was very slow. Totila had dispatched various troops to employ delaying tactics, and the Franks, who were enemies of Nerses's allies, the Lombards, did not allow free passage. Why would they? Exactly. Procopius stated that Nerses was, and I quote, completely bewildered. But John was familiar with that part of Italy and advised him on how to continue. John sounds like a good adversary. Using this advice, Nerses was able to reach Ravenna unopposed. Totila may have believed that Nerses was going to come from the sea whence all the previous invasions had come. Yeah, yeah. So it looks like this guy John had some good knowledge. Yeah, Yeah. John John actually helps him a lot uh, throughout his life. Yes, Um, yeah. Yeah. We're going to be mentioning him quite a few more times, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, everybody, as we're reading this, thank you for joining us. Again, we both, Mike and I, are live in the chat. Ask us any questions. We'll answer as best to our knowledge. And as we're going through this, if there's anything that you guys want to research, bring it up. Maybe we might have missed. Uh, let us know. So um, on his way to seek Totila's main army, Nerses encountered a small Gothic garrison at the town of Rimini. John, who had previously been in command at Rimini when it was besieged by the Gothic forces, again gave advice to Nerses on how to proceed. I, John, John's a cool, cool friend. Well, I mean, yeah. look, every good, every good leader needs advers- a- yeah. advisors. I right? wonder if John was Armenian. 
Uh, I don't think so. No? no. I don't. That so, doesn't sound like it. Yes, I'm high up. Of course. <laughs> the exact route taken was not precisely indicated by Procopius and has led to confusion on their reconstruction of the coming battles. Procopius referred to the next battle as Busta Galorum. Right? Yeah. Is that how you say it? Yeah, yeah. Oof, I guess. Good job. Yeah, yeah, good job. Galorum. Latin, Latin yeah. lesson 101. Yeah, there you go. But many historians now refer to it as the Battle of Tagane. Nerses sent word to Totila and gave him a chance to either surrender or give the day in which the battle would take place. Procopius quoted to Procopius quoted Totila's response. At the end of eight days, let us match our strength. Nerses was not fooled by this and preferred the tactical defense upon meeting Totila, as his army would have been larger than that of Totila, basically. The following battle would be Nerses' ultimate um, be ultimate victory and would set the estimation of his military talents as not inferior to those of the Belisarius. Yeah. Um, this guy put up... I'm, I'm curious why eight days... Like what was there some sort of term limit on this battle and then who whoever like would you have a draw after eight days or well I don't know but or who suffers the most after eight days Nerses Nerses kind of I, I know, you know I'm being a little bit of a clown about this but like I, when I when I was going through the notes I'm like wait a minute hey, did he just suggest that let's go to battle for eight days and test our strength like who could survive eight days like basically yeah. like at yeah. the end of it let's see how many people you have and let's see how many people you have. And then we can decide the winner. It's almost like a 12-round boxing match. Yeah, I guess something like that. Right? But, you know, um, Nerses read into it, and he, he saw that. Yeah. You know, no, he knew what he was doing. Anyway, amongst many of Nerses' great successes at the Battle of Tagane was to come from the disposition of his forces before the battle began. Nerses arrayed his troops in a crescent-shaped formation with mostly infantry in the middle, flanked by the archers. The infantry were, in fact, dismounted cavalry, since many of the Goths thought that typical infantry was frail and would flee in the face of a charge. Some historians feel there may have been a political motivation by placing the allied Heruli and Lombards in the center dismounted. Nerses possibly suspected them of having sympathy or admiration for Totila. Interesting, there's already problems from within, it seems. Yeah. On the sides of the crescent, foot archers were placed, and this enabled them to destroy the Gothic cavalry through enfilading fire. This disposition of the archers and their effect upon the battle is strikingly parallel to the later Battle of Agincourt. Next, Nerses placed much of his cavalry on the immediate sides of the dismounted inf infantry. This guy was a tactician. Yeah. Normally, it's a lot of moving and shaking. You know what I mean? I mean, it reminds me of all the, um, like, you know, the tactics that Vahan and Vartan. But that used. was three sided. Remember, they were very yeah. specific about the description. It was but again with the archers. The yes, archers were yeah, big. You but know? but this is this seems like it's got a lot more moving parts. Yeah. At least that's what it, it's the picture I'm painting in my head. Normally, the cavalry would have been behind the center but they were not meant to aid any of the struggling lines. Instead, they were used to deliver a surprise attack on the Goths when they became fully enveloped. Nerses knew that Totila would take the advantage of attacking the weak center th and therefore allowed Nerses to completely destroy the Ostrogothic army. Mm. So it was, looks like it was just like, like I said, it, would, it seemed... As though there was like punch after punch after punch. Yeah. And that was planned that way. It was by design. Yeah. No, it you was know? just overwhelming. I don't think anybody Which did. means you have to know your opponents well. Of course. That's what I'm saying. He, yeah. he read into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah. Know. you know, you have to know your opponents well. It's not, you can't be throwing the same playbook at whatever, you know. Let's I mean, say, you know, if you look at it, obviously, let's say, you're play, let's say you're playing chess. You and I played chess five, six matches and I kept using the same tactic. You're going to yeah. catch on. Yeah, yeah. That's what right? I'm saying. But I got to know how you play. You know, so I'm I can be not going to tell you how I play. Well, fine. All right. So there goes our friendship. <laughs> Want to do a match of chess? Yeah. Eight days. Eight days. Eight days. Eight days. <laughs> Eight, Eight days. days of chess. Eight days. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So uh, Procopius said that Tatila had been outgeneraled by his own folly. 
because Totilla had instructed his troops to only engage with spears, which is a weird command to give, as he thought a quick strike would win the battle. Maybe Unfortunately, they, maybe he didn't. thought maybe he thought there was they had like special weapons. You what know? do you mean? I don't know. Maybe they maybe they had some sort of uh, weaponry that had functioned well in earlier battles and whatnot. You know what I mean? Maybe against weaker forces or something. Sure, like that. Yeah. but he, he obviously relied on that. So hence, hence why it said he outgeneraled his own folly. Which, yeah. which more or less says that like he went in there with a specific approach that had worked previously that obviously failed now. Yeah, well, I'm saying Ners has probably learned about that or you know same playbook. Uh, knew about the battles. I don't know who was yeah. writing those, but he probably yeah. read their... Uh, Procopius was. Procopius <laughs> read his stories. Um, so, Totila sent wave after wave of troops who became so disorganized by the raining arrow, arrow storm that by the time they met the dismounted infantrymen, they were completely broken. The Gothic infantry never even engaged in actual combat as they hesitated to advance far enough to actually become effective. They were kept in the rear of the advance, fearing that Nerses' Nerses's horsemen would outflank the form uh, uh, from the hill. Um, finally, Totila's cavalry was passed, or I should say pressed, backwards onto their own line of infantry. Nerses then charged with his own cavalry, which had been held in reserve. The retreat quickly turned into a rout as the Gothic cavalry rushed right over the infantry, who joined them in the withdrawal. Totila himself was killed at the battle. Dun, dun, dun. Mm, poor Totila. Game, game over. Yeah, that was that. Game over. I mean, he was. I mean, there was no way to battle what, what Nerses no, was doing. No, it was it impossible. Seemed like, it seemed like Nerses and, and John threw everything at him. Not just that. It's just, you know, his bad move. The, it says it right there. You know, his, his, his guys were so exhausted and tired and disorganized. By the time, you know, they realized what was happening, it was too late, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So in um 552, Nerses marched to Rome after the Battle of Tagane and had to conduct a short siege of the city. Nerses attacked on one side with a large contingent of archers, while John assaulted another part of the walls. Not only was he an advisor, but he was also a war man. Yeah. After successfully capturing Rome. Nerses would work to remove all of the remaining Ostrogoth forces from Italy. The next major move that Nerses undertook was to capture the treasury of Totila that was held in Kumai. So he's going after their gold. Both Procopius... What was it called? What? What was the gold called? <laughs> I, um, the treasury, bro. No, no, the gold. What did they call it? Oh, uh, damn, I already forgot. <laughs> Solidit. Solidit. Wait, Solidity? Solidity, yeah. all right. I think so. <laughs> Solidity, no, Solidity. Solidity, right. there we go. Yeah, He's Solidi. going after the Solidity. Yeah, they're going after the Solidity. Yeah. <laughs> all right, continue, sorry. Procopius called it, and I quote, an exceedingly strong fortress, and Agathius declared it very well fortified. So apparently they were going after Fort Knox. Yeah. As parts of the army were sent throughout the country to deal with Tyus, who was the son of Totila and the new Gothic king, a considerable detachment was sent to Campania to take Kumai. Tyus followed the example set by Nerses on his march into Italy and marched around the imperial army. After engaging Nerses in small skirmishes for nearly two months, Tyus retreated into the mountains. Yeah. He was having a hard time. Yep. The Goths suddenly came down the mountain in a compact phalanx, catching Nerses' army off guard, who were also on foot. The reason why the Goths attacked Horseless is unknown, but the suddenness of the attack seemed to be the reason that Nerses fought Horseless as well. The ensuing battle was fought for two days, and Procopius described the bravery of King Theus. His first introduced the battle as the Battle of Great Note, and the heroism displayed by the King Theus was not inferior to any of the heroes of legend. It may be noted that Procopius did not witness any of the battle and only retold it from the account of others. It seems like he wasn't at every battle. Yeah, maybe he was covering another battle. Yeah, he was busy. He, he was, was on assignment. <laughs> he was on assignment for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> it was probably oh, yeah. some other more important battle yeah. going on. <laughs> it's like, all right, guys, cover for me. I'll be over there. Yeah, yeah. And make sure you write everything down. <laughs> <laughs> and he gets mad at the notes. Yeah. <laughs> That's not him, god you damn it. You missed it. You missed it. <laughs> all right. Um, Tia's led the charge towards Nerses. Procopius recounts that, again, Procopius, how does he recount... <laughs> Procopius recounts that every time his shield was filled with arrows, he received another from his men at arms. Finally, when a spear struck his shield, he received another, but was struck within a mortal blow. So I guess it wasn't quick enough, you know, yeah. and, and he yeah. got struck. The soldier cut off the uh, the soldier cut off Tius's head to display to the Goths their king had died. But instead of disheartening the Goths, it reinvigorated them to fight for another day. The second day was much like the first, as the Goths charged and fought on foot, invo involved little to no tactics. Finally, the Goths sent some of their officers to Nerses, who said they would surrender if they were allowed to leave the country safely. Nerses, who received more advice from John, accepted those terms of surrender. All right, now he's playing peacemaker. I yeah. like it. Yeah. You know, hold on. Let's go back to this Procopius thing. <laughs> This guy. I mean, like, I wonder how it worked back then. Seriously, I'm I'm curious how maybe it worked. our audience can help. I, us. No, I mean, no, no. <laughs> seriously, we one day we should look into this, or maybe ask Gevor because Gevor knows everything about like back then. By the way, speaking of Gevor, this is his research oh, he, with yeah. some of his colleagues Gevork. and everything. Thank you, Gevor. We appreciate it. Yes. We love it. Hopefully, we're doing justice to what but, you have given us. So. I mean, Gevor's well aware that sometimes I can be a clown about certain things from the past, sometimes. which is fine. Fine, many, more than sometimes. But this Procopius thing, okay, yeah. or anybody of the sort, it's almost like the modern day media, yeah. right? They're there to cover war, to take Your hand notes. Is in my shot. History. Your hand is in my shot. Historical. <laughs> histor <laughs> his, historical. Stop notes with on the whole. Battles. God, you're making me lose my train of thought. But like, how, like in this instance, if he, a quote unquote, wasn't, may had not have been there, mm -hmm. right? Like, who do you get to cover for you? Do you like yeah, your apprentices, maybe. whatnot? Like, Probably. you have a team of people. I'm not kidding you. I know it sounds like a comical topic, but I'm actually willing to look into this because <laughs> this is really awesome. Like, who there, was there? Were his... so many. Think about all the battles that were going on with people back then. Yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to make like make it sound like the world was a war zone, but there were obviously significant battles going on in so many different regions. What I want to know. What I want to know. At where were they actually sitting and watching this battle? Uh, um, and, and 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 not to be away. you know obviously they're got to be on one side right they, because they have to tell the story from the winner side or the loser side and, whatever and, it is and but that's another thing that see, wouldn't that the other enemy see send, them send, send somebody to, to to go cut yeah. this guy up yeah that's what right? i'm saying like where were yeah, they like sitting? was there some sort of agreement it's like okay well the press is neutral like leave the press alone because they need to record what's going on mm -hmm. or maybe they had someone on their end and maybe they were hanging out together like, who knows? I don't. I don't know, man, but this know. is awesome. Like, Guys, I, can you I, help us, please? I really want to find know. out more yeah. about this. Yeah. Um, Where were we? After the final defeat of the Goths, the Franks, led by the the brothers, uh, Lutheris and Buccellinus, butch butchered their names, yeah, it's okay. attempted to invade the recently reconquered lands. The contemporary account in Liber Pontificalis noted... And I quote, the Franks in like manner wasted Italy, but with the help of the Lord, they too were destroyed by Nerses, and all Italy rejoiced. Wow. For the next year, next year or two, Nerses crossed the countryside, reinstituting Byzantine rule and laying siege to the towns that resisted. God, the guy didn't take no for an answer. But as more and more Franks poured over the Alps... Nerses regrouped in Rome, and once spring came, marched his army against them. The Franks, led by the two brothers, were pursuing separate routes, but plundering the entire time. These guys were disastrous people. At the Battle of Casalinum in 554, Nerses put true heavy infantry in the center instead of dismounted cavalry. These were hand-picked troops known as Antes Signani, who wore long clad coats of chain mail or mail that went down to their feet. Dude, that's got to be a lot of weight. Tell me about that it. That stuff's right? really heavy, man. 
highly trained cavalry, which included Armenian cataphracts, we've talked about the Armenian cataphracts before, were on the flanks, armed with everything that the army carried. Wow. On, yeah, I've, wow. It's like, a, it's like a fully armed Apache. On the opposing side, the contemporary Byzantine historian Agathius describes the Franks as, and I quote, without cavalry, their swords were worn on the left leg, and their main weapons were the throwing axe and hooked javelins. That sounds painful. Oof. But they, dude, with axes, man, it's a short range weapon. Yeah. Right? Not just short range. It's 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 face it's a, to face. Well, well, almost, besides face to throwing, face besides it, the throwing, it's yeah. a short range yeah. weapon. So these yeah. guys are ready to like go at each other. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. You know, the battles back then, people don't, th- you know, you see it in the movies. It's one thing when you talk about, I don't know if we've covered this about the, like to be face to face and what, talk about movies. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the actual battle. It, yeah. You know, like I think we've had conversation about this, you know, off air mm-hmm. and um, being so close and, and constantly killing a human being versus the soldiers nowadays that are, you know, you, you've got a sniper or whatever. Yeah. To this and, and what are your odds of survival? Have you ever thought about that? Like, honestly, has anyone, have any one of you guys ever thought yeah. about, let's say, the hand-to-hand combat from, like, back then? Stuff we see in movies. But here's right? the thing. Th- that's what the odds of survival. You're talking about somebody fighting. Let's say you're fighting somebody, right? And it. somebody behind yeah, you. in the mix of it, somebody sees you're taking on somebody and just comes at you with a sword. and Or an or, axe. Or an axe. Yeah. You're likely, or just doesn't even bother coming near you. and just goes, yeah. whoop. Yeah. That's it. You're done. Yeah, you're done. Like that's the why there were so many casualties. Yeah, the I mean, odds of survival you know. for for one person to how many they took out is crazy. Like, yeah. It's just yeah. it's beyond me. Um, the Franks attacked Nerses at the center, which was initially pushed back, but was reinforced by the allied Herulis, who slowed the attackers. At this point, Nerses had the cavalry will inform the flanks, but without dire- directly engaging the Franks, instead. He had them unleash an enormous number of arrows into the Franks who became disorganized and their tightly held formation broke down. Again, the arrows, you know, the, the, I mean, that was the first thing. It's the first thing you do, right? Yeah. At least according to what we've seen in film. But, but even, even with some of the stuff that we talk about, you see a lot of those tactics more in a a later, like 12th, 13th, 15th, like all the time. It's, I mean, that's all you had, right? So you're going to send your arrows first, try to take out as many people as you can. And then whatever else comes out of you. Now, Nerses sounded a general charge that blasted their ranks and mowed them down. The Franks were massacred and Agathias claimed that only five of them escaped from Nerses that day. Only five. five. Wow. Wow. All three of Nurses' major victories can be credited to his skillful use of combined tactics involving cavalry and archers to create an ex- uh, to create and exploit disorder in his enemies. Afterwards, in the autumn of 554, Nurses became the last general to receive an official Roman triumph in the city of Rome. Wow! In 555, near Capua, Nurses scored a final victory over the combined armies of. Ostrogothus, Franks, and other allies, which effectively ended the attempts by the Orthogoths to reestablish their kingdom in Italy. I uh, it, again, we don't have. We're not. We're not talking about all the minute details of Nerses yeah. Kamsarakan's life, but it just seems like I know it's going to sound like to anybody. This guy was constantly in battles. It's like he, he finished one battle, went to sleep, and then he woke up to another battle. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's what it sounds guy. like. He was a busy guy. Yeah. And, and, you know, but but that says a lot about how the Roman... Uh, uh, the valid Romans point. Very actually valid dependent point. on him. And, you know, he was Armenian. And <laughs> he pretty much, you know... It, and <laughs> you, he, he, <laughs> you know, it's just like, you know, he, he pretty much kept Rome at that time. Yeah, you he know? did. Uh, Rome is existing because of him. Because if he didn't, or well, I wouldn't say Rome is existing because no, of him. But, but think he, about he, it. He, he, because he, if he the, kept he kept the initial wave of what was going to be the end of the Roman Empire at bay. Okay, but if he didn't, then there would be no uh, Rome. It would have but, a I lot mean, sooner than it actually ended. A, way a, a lot sooner yeah, than yeah, it yeah, actually yeah, ended yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, don't break the glass. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Uh, but what I was going to say, it reminds me of how Vartan was fighting for the Persians, you know, 
Vahan was fight, fighting for the Persians, they always fought for another emperor yeah. and actually helped yeah. them win. Yes. And if they didn't, those those em uh, empires could have fallen. Of, of course. So I you're mean, welcome. Yes, Rome. Yeah. Yes, Rome and Persia and, and whoever else we helped fight. Oh. All right. That's so different, um, different topic for a different podcast. Yeah. Discuss amongst yourself. <laughs> I, I have. Yes. Um, so contact me. We'll talk. Yeah. Um, for the next 12 years, it is thought that Nersa stayed in and set about to reorganize Italy. Justinian sent Nersa a series of new decrees known as pragmatic Pergr sanctions. Many historians refer to Nersa in this part of his career as an exarch or the imperial governor of a large and important region of the empire, in this case, Italy. Who would have thought they were practicing sanctions back then too? Yeah, yeah. Nersus completed some restoration projects in Italy, but was unable to return Rome to its former splendor, though he did repair many of the bridges in the city and rebuild the city's walls. Nersus ruled Rome and other parts of Italy until the end of his life. An Armenian general ruled Rome till the end of his life. Yes. I mean, how many of you know about this? Yes. I just want to know, you know, it's, I it's didn't. amazing. I, I didn't. It's amazing. I didn't before this. Um, it's great. Some historians believe Nerses died in 561, while other assert that he died in 574, entitling that he may have reached the age of 96. Wow. Man, 96 at and that they, time. And they said people didn't live that long back then? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And they were taller too. Yes, they were. Um, Paul the deacon wrote that his body was returned to Constantinople, and John of Ephesus wrote that Nerses was buried in the presence of the Byzantine emperor and empress in the Bithynian monastery founded by Nerses. Yeah. So he ruled Rome, as more an or less, more or less, Armenian yeah. general. Uh, I mean, yeah, Rome. He ruled Rome. Yeah, and, and pretty much Italy. And he he had founded the 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 Bithynian monastery. Does this not just this, this, in Constantinople? Does, I mean, does this not describe to you the movie Gladiator somewhat, except for the avenge the revenge part? I mean, forget the movie, man. This is this is just, incredible. I'm just this saying. is incredible. This man, like you know, yeah. Rome it should have statues of this man and thanking maybe him. They, this maybe guy. they do. Maybe, maybe they I don't do. know. I haven't I haven't looked into it. Rome had like eight billion statues right maybe our audience can look into it maybe they do have one i'll, I'll look into I, it I, after after we're done with i those. mean you you you're a love of roman history you know how many times have you heard of nerses or anything about him i have not i mean that's, and, that's and, and it's not like it was a small because time you're talking look, about what don't from forget five? don't forget what we learn what we learned with like mainstream narr narrative history is the mainstream individuals you don't learn about the sub players and in the sub players below that unless yeah. you become a roman historian yeah right um yeah. in the modern day that's the only way you become accustomed to anything any sort of uh, level of detail so with us diving into this this is amazing to find yeah. out that there's that connection right yes yeah. yeah incredible and it's not the end of it by the way it's not the end of it yeah so here we go so continuing it is important to point out that the armenian nobility rose to prominence in the Byzantine Empire during the time of Nerses. That process intensified after the 6th century and by the early 7th century, Emperor Her Heraclius I, who was of Armenian origin, established a new Armenian dynasty of the Byzantine Empire, which bore his name and ruled the Byzantine Empire from 610 to 711 AD, where the, the dates were basically the reign of the Heraclean dynasty. 610 to 711. That's Yeah, it's a, over 100, 101 years. Right? Wow. Yeah. A number of Armenian emperors ruled the Byzantine Empire after the 8th century. Let me repeat that. A number of Armenian emperors ruled the Byzantine Empire after the 8th century. Look into it. It's fact. A new Armenian dynasty, also called Macedonian, after the Byzantine theme from which its founder hailed from, was established in 867 by Basil I, or Barser in Armenian. Mm -hmm. The Armenian Macedonian dynasty ruled Byzantium until 1056. As we have promised, 
we will cover the history of the Armenian dynasties that mm -hmm. during this time and Armenian yeah. emperors and empresses of the Byzantine, Byzantine Empire in um, podcasts that will follow. Uh, yeah. We have a lot more information coming um, about this time time period. Yeah. We're going to be getting there with the Armenian history side of things. And also, as you can see, they were also involved in the Eastern Roman or Byzantium. Yeah, yeah. Just just for our audience to know, guys, I mean, this when, when we're doing this one-on-one -on -one thing, our goal, and, and this is something we've had a lot of meetings with Kevork and his colleagues, is to cover pretty much almost 20,000 years of history as an, uh, as an overview yeah as an overview yeah. and then we're going to get into the details of uh, of pretty much like certain people that we know about that are these characters that are in here more about them but it, this is just fascinating stuff so that we are bringing to you guys yeah so so we're going to be here for a long time not I'm, here right now, but I'm okay you know, I'm <laughs> we're going to okay be doing this as long as possible. Um, hopefully, you know, 20 seasons to come. So, but where were we? Um, yeah, continue. Was you, did you finish? No. Oh, it's my turn. Okay, sorry. So um, now coming back to the history of the 6th century Armenia in 539, the new Byzantine Sasanian War had broken out in the Armenian uh, frontier. Again, Armenia was the main theater of operations for the armies of both empires. As we noted, the Byzantine-controlled western portions of Armenia, however, here too, like in those parts of Armenia in the east where the Sasanian had control, local Armenian Naharars had self-autonomy. In the 5th through 6th centuries, the Armenian territory within the Byzantine Empire included Lesser Armenia, or Armenia Minor, west of the uh, Euphrates River. The territory of Greater Armenia, immediately east of the Euphrates River, was, div uh, was divided into two provinces known as the Saterpi of Armenia and Inner Armenia, also known as Armenia Interior, the latter mostly encompassing the territory of Upper Armenia. Now, I, I want everybody to follow through about what the, yeah, how many it, it gets divisions. A it's, it's, it's crazy up here. Um, inner Armenia's capital was at Karin. Unlike Armenia Minor, west of the Euphrates, the new territories in the western portions of Armenia, which came under Byzantine rule in 38, uh, 387, according to the terms of the Peace of, of Asilicine, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. You retained, are, sir, you are. Yeah, I am? Okay. Uh, retained a, uh, a, a varying level of autonomy. Emperor Thedesius I divided Lesser Armenia into two provinces, the first Armenia with the capital of Sebastia and second Armenia with its capital of uh, Malatia. This part confuses me. I yeah, mean, it's it's unbelievable. I, 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 I would like to look at a map for this yeah. to just really get an understanding of where everything is, but... It, it, it takes it takes a minute for you to visualize things. If, I, I you, just, if you know that my if brain was like I was reading yeah, something like what if you're like, aware of the the geography in that area from back then. I know a lot of cities and and areas have changed names because yeah. things have changed. Obviously, um, you can somewhat visualize it, but it's hard. Yeah, yeah, right. Because they, we were split between. A I mean, so many a, things. A couple it, empires yeah. here. And in one empire having a couple divisions to it. Yeah, yeah. And, and and it continues. Now, the northern half of Armenia Major, after 387, was cons uh, constituted as a civitas stipendaria under a civil governor titled comes Armenia, or uh, the Count of Armenia, meaning that it retained internal autonomy, but was obligated to pay tribute and provide soldiers for the regular East Roman army. You get an A for your Latin lesson Thanks, today. Man. Thanks, man. So far. Wow. I think there's more. I think there is more. Not so much editing, I guess. Oh, <laughs> we're both doing pretty good. <laughs> the, the territory of the five satrapies of Armenia enjoyed the... Just noticed my... Jesus, my tan land. <laughs> what the hell? Oh, boy. Oh, oh all boy. Right. <laughs> I just noticed the Looks camera. like we're not doing a video for this. <laughs> no, I can tell. I was just joking. Continue. The territory of the five satrapies of Armenia enjoyed the greatest degree of home rule. The satrapies, known in Latin as gentis, in the southwestern Armenia, 
which had been under Roman influence since 298, where were a group of five fully autonomous Armenian principalities allied to the empire known in Latin as Civitas Foderate. Did I do well? Did I do well? You did, you did great, man. You're doing I better than me. I might have butchered it, but anyway. This is where it somewhat starts getting even more confusing, okay? They were made up of the counties of Hashtyank, Tsopk, Anzit, Agertun, and Balahovit. The Latinized names of the counties were recorded in the Byzantine sources as Astianin, Sophin, Ansitin, Ing- Ingelin, and Balabitin. I mean, it's all over the place with this. The names of different places and whatnot, different peoples. You're doing great, my friend. You're doing great. I know. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> Each of them was ruled by a local Armenian Nakharar that ruled in a hereditary manner as a semi-independent king. However, during the reign of Emperor Zeno between 484 to 488 AD, a revolt led by the Byzantine general Ilus had broken out and the above noted five Armenian semi-independent Nakharars supported Ilus's forces. Zeno was able to put down the revolt and as punishment ordered the temporary termination of the hereditary rights of the five Armenian Nakharar's houses. So that didn't last very long. Why does Zeno sound like like I'm picturing some like I'm I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> Zeno. I'm, I'm <laughs> Yeah, have, like okay. like I, I like he's one of the guys in the neighborhood. Yeah, know? yeah. Zeno and get him. Zeno and Hayata. Zeno in Bon Chelsea. All right, enough. Oh, back to the Romans, okay? Right. Only one of the Nakharars, who was the leader of Balahovit, was allowed to keep his hereditary rights and titles. Um, we don't have any information on that as to why. Instead of the Armenian Nakharars, Zeno, in the four counties of the Satrapy of Armenia, appointed Byzantine governors. However, the, lo- the local Armenian military made up of both infantry and cavalry formations was not disbanded and con- continued to enjoy special rights and privileges within the overall Byzantine armed forces, where at least they got taken care of. You know, it's funny. It's, it's, if everything we've gone through, all the episodes through all the eras, yeah. it seems like it's always the case. Like, they just, they're like, like you know what? We're just going to let them still do what they want to do somewhat no no they do they do all i mean look go back to all the episodes at the end they always allowed them to be them even though they were under their rule you know there was that i don't know what you want to call it but they allowed Uh, them. yeah it was it was never full autonomy yeah it was never it was bare well not never i don't want to use never they were fully independent at some points but yeah yeah so, um, however, all of this changed during the rule of Emperor Justinian, the first who carried out a series of comprehensive administrative reforms, which also included the territory of Armenia under the Byzantine rule. Already, soon after his assassination in 527... Accession. Already, soon after his accession in 527, the Dukes Armenia, responsible for Armenia Minor... And comes Armeni, the above noted Nakharas of the five counties, were abolished, and the military force of the Armenian territories were subordinate to a new Magister Militum. Militum? Yeah, Magister Militum per Armenia at Karin. I'm doing pretty good with these words. I would have done better. Yeah? Mm. You want to read it? No. No? Okay. Go ahead. Continue. Go ahead. Go ahead. In 536, new reforms were enacted that abolished the autonomy of the Trans-Euphrates territories and formed four new uh, regular provinces that became known as the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Armenians. I I mean, how many Armenias? Again... I, this is like, I, how many times can you chop up one land I, I and call it like, one army? Two I feel armies? like the last two pages we've read can literally be like a 15 second map morphing GIF. Uh, seriously. GIF, GIF, however you guys prefer to say it. Whatever. Unbelievable. What are you guys thinking? Um, thus, according to the new administrative decision carried out by Justinian, Armenia interior was joined with part of the Pontus 
Plomanakis, yeah, Plomanakis, yeah, mm. and First Armenia to form a new province. First Armenia Magana, the old First Armenia, the second Armenia were redivided into second and third Armenias. You guys following here? Because I'm not. Um, with the center of these two provinces, Sabestia and Malatia, respectively, and the five counties of the satrapy of Armenia formed a new fourth Armenia province. My God. Um, in 530... They, yeah, they were shifting They were shifting borders and boundaries like crazy. Look, we've heard of Sebastia and, and Malatia a yeah. lot. But but in terms of the border shifting, man, like what, what's going on here? I'm, I mean, somebody I mean, was pencil happy. It... it, 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 it it seems like a lot of the provinces that were pre-existing, yeah. right, were were either being boundary shrunken or enlarged. I'd love to look at maps. I am a map freak, you know that, and and see how this shifted year by year, maybe decade. Not just by... a map freak. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> did we really have to go that deep? Well, you, you mentioned. I'm not going to go that deep. All right, maybe off camera. <laughs> You can, you can cut that. Uh, uh, no, I'm not cutting that. I'm not cutting that. Nope. Nope. Oh, okay. Nope. nope, nope. That's, We're that's keeping gonna it in there. Bad. Nope. That's going to be bad. No, it's not. Yes, All it right. is. Audience, hey, do you guys hey, think that's you, bad? Hey, no. You we're, suggested we're, it, man. Yeah, We're you good. Suggested we're it. good. We're good. All right. All right. Where were we? Um, in 538, the Armenian Nakharas of Byzantine Armenia rose up against these policies, being upset by the termination of their hereditary rights readjustment of the old administrative division and implementation of heavy taxation and cruel behavior by a uh, pro uh, council of first Armenia and Armenia Prima Acacius or Akak in Armenia <laughs> who happened to be of Armenian descent but as a career imperial um, bureaucrat shared little with the national uh, aspirations of the Naharars. Yeah, this guy's not a good guy. We're going to get into it. Man, I, I mean... Acacius is not a good dude. Yeah. 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 I'm, but I'm, still, I'm still lost. I'm still lost on these shifts and changes. Well, look, and, it's and a lot of... Again, like I was mentioning earlier, it's, it seems like a lot of border shifting and whatnot. And I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure this was tactical to some degree or to a major degree. Yeah. Um, Again, the best way we could describe this, if we were to be able to be able to present maps of these shifts every time it happened, because Lord knows the map, if any of us have ever observed any existing Armenian maps on Google search or whatever the case yeah. is, we've always seen things change so many times, especially, especially after about like the 350s to 400 yeah. AD, right? Yeah. Like yeah. it shifted so much. Um, anyway, this Acacius guy, let's pay attention to him. One of the first things that Acacius did after being appointed as proconsul of First Armenia was to bring forth accusations of treason against his friend Hamazas Mamikonian, who was well, who was a well respected Naharar leader. Acacius eliminated a prominent Armenian rival of Byzantine Armenia by accusing Hamazas of conspiring with the Sasanians to overthrow Justinian's rule in western portions of Armenia. We always have one of those bastards. Well, you know, every every period we've gone through, there's always one. Yeah, of these. this is this is a guy. I'm thinking if there's enough information on him that we could talk about. I know we don't really want to talk about villainous people, but yeah. He was Armenian. Why did you do what you did? What was his ties? Like, what what kind of information is there about him of from back then? I'd, I'd be curious to have a little portion of understanding of why this guy did what he did. Do you think back then the Armenian, that pride, not just the pride, well, that like, you know how an Armenian never would kill an Armenian? That, that thing we have inside of us. Not that it doesn't happen, but, um, you know, do you think, and, and that comes from the fact that everything we've gone through with the massacres from the 19th century to the 20th century, right? There's this thing that Armenians have that, uh, not that Armenians don't hurt one another or kill one another, but it's like one of those things, it's like an unspoken feeling and a rule that like, you just don't do that to one Look, another. And I've, if you do, you're so, you're so like, doesn't it, does down it, upon, but hold on, it, hold on, let me finish. What I'm trying to say is, do you think back then that same spirit was there 
because th even though there has been wars and things like that, the Armenians hadn't experienced this type of a massacre where, you know, 1.5 million or 300,000 of them died in, in such a short amount of time. They were, there were wars, there were battles, they were empires, they lost it, they were under rule, this, that. But that's what I'm saying. That's why when you say that, how do you do that to another Armenian? I don't think back then that spirit was there. But, but I don't think it's much to do with spirit. I think the fact that we were spread, and we've learned this through our journey so far, we were spread around through so many different factions, empires, peoples, cultures in that area yeah. of the world. Just because somebody was Armenian, I mean, shoot, it exists kind of today too, right? There are some people that are very lukewarm about the genocide and the happenings yeah. of the genocide. Yeah. Very lukewarm. Yeah. They pay attention to it, but they're very lukewarm about it. Yeah. I know people like this. You know people like this. And then there's some people who are very aggressive about it, right? Mm -hmm. That in and of itself can cause some sort of uh, quarrel conflict because you're looking at this lukewarm and how can you not give more of a blah 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 about it and then somebody looks at you and says well why do you give so much of a hoot about it right yeah. so I know this is on a smaller scale but you have to understand that in that portion of time's defense there were certain individuals that just grew up with a certain influence maybe this Acacius and I'm not defending this dude grew up or just kind of got involved with the Roman side of politics. True. true right? Yeah. And and that was where his mindset, because look, we are products of nature and yeah. nurture, correct? So if, if, if that nature that he grew up in was his full-on influence, he's obviously got some sort of maybe power-hungry vendetta against doesn't matter who, if it's his people or not. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? No, no, I agree with like, you. I agree with it, you. It, I mean, a lot of the lukewarm Armenians nowadays that about the genocide are typically from abroad. Think about it. They're mm. not necessarily... Look, in LA, we have a lot of influence. We have a lot of influence with the individuals here. We have so many Armenians here and everybody kind of bands together when it yeah. comes time, right? But there's a lot of people that maybe are very sporadic, let's say. And I'm not knock... I'm just hypothetically speaking. So if we have an audience from any particular place, I'm going to say, it, let's say, I don't know, Mexico or or somewhere in South America, where maybe our, our people are a little bit more sporadic, they might be a little bit more lukewarm to it. Not everybody, just that one yeah. soul, two souls, No, but I, I, I don't know. Like for me, I still think that back then, it, I don't think it was I might the be same, wrong. same. I might be wrong. I'm just guessing. But what does the audience think, guys? You guys think back then Armenians were did have that that spirit that I'm trying to describe or Look, Mike is Dig, trying to say? Tigran, Tigran yeah. had to unite these people, right? Yeah. They were Armenians. Yeah. Amongst other people that of he course, united. Yeah. Tigran still that was his his goal was to unite Armenians in that region. Right? And yes, he succeeded. Yes, I understand. But what my point is the type of devastation that we have faced in the last uh, two centuries. Two thousand no, years. No, 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 no. Two centuries. The two centuries, the amount of massacres that... Because we were almost powerless at that time. Yeah. Back then, when they attacked us, we fought back because it was different. We were, we were a powerful country. We still had a large amount of land. We were never down to this small no, thing, you know, we weren't. So that's what I'm saying. Like, I feel like back then it was a different feeling of being Armenian than it is now. Sure. There, I mean, that's but, what I'm saying. That's but, why, but that, like, but that pride, the, yeah. the present day pride comes from more modern day events. No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. What do you guys think? Let us know in the chats. Um, like I said, we are in the chat live with Again, you. Again, it's, it's uh, a debatable thing. Yeah, debatable you know, thing. You, you, what is the not, audience We're think? not we're not pros yeah. at this. You know, we'd love to have a conversation yeah. about it and hear other people's opinions and thoughts. Yeah. Fantastic so, topic right. to talk about. Okay, continuing. Where were um, we? Justinian believed Acacius and allowed the latter to arrest and execute Hamazosp. God, they took his word for it. Procopius suggested that Acacius, his accusations were false and that the real reason was simply Acacius's desire to remove potential rivals. Sounds so innocent. Acacius proved highly unpopular with the population of his province, gaining a reputation for cruelty and greed. Procopius reported about him. 
and I quote, And being biased by nature, he, Acacius, gained the opportunity of displaying his inward character, and he proved to be the most cruel of all men toward his subjects. For he plundered their property without excuse and ordained that they should pay an unheard of tax of four centenaria. I didn't look into centenaria. (laughs) I knew you were going to ask. But the Armenians, unable to bear him any longer, conspired together and slew Acacius. Good for them. Another passage of Procopius named Artavan Arshakuni as the Armenian leader who executed Acacius in 539. And you've got more on that. Yeah, well, Arshakuni dynasty. Yeah. Um, in essence, Justinian's reform struck um, uh, at the very heart of the Naharar system, which prior to this existed for many centuries and after the so-called reforms was effectively eliminated by, in Byzantine Armenia. The uprising was led by Artavan Arshakuni and his brother Hovanes, representatives of the old Armenian royal dynasty that ruled Greater Armenia for four centuries. Um, we've, we've talked about this, so uh, do those of you who have missed our episode, go back. Mm-hmm. Um, they were joined by Vasak Mamikonyan, not to be confused with the brother of Vahan Mamikonyan, yeah. who uh, who also bore that name half a century prior. Procopius described Artaban as an outstanding leader, noted. Now, when Artabanus reached Byzantium, the common people admire him for his achievements and loved him for his other qualities, for he was both tall of stature and handsome of a noble character and a little given to speech. And the emperor had honored him in a very unusual manner, for he had appointed him general of the troops of Byzantium and commander of the federate troops, as well as clothing him with the dignity of council. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? It sounds like he was a very great man. And handsome. And tall. And tall. And little of speech. Very, very soft-spoken, maybe. Just like you. I wouldn't say so. <laughs> I have a pretty bassy voice. No, talk about the speech part. <laughs> yeah, I'm not one for speeches. <laughs> really? You're I, not one for speeches? No, dude. You can't I, stop talking, man. I, I, yeah, talking I can't about? stop talking, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I was one for speeches. Dude, You know, okay, growing up playing hockey, you understand, like... I'm not bragging, but you you knew I was like either a captain or assistant captain. I hated it when the coach had to have me, <laughs> Mike, get up and say something. Uh, 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 let's win. Let's win. I mean, seriously, that's the way I was as a kid. Go Bears, go. Go Bears, go. Yeah. Right. The houses of Ashakuni, Mami Konyan, and Bagraduni took part in the uprising of 538 and 539 AD. After the assassination of Acacius, Justinian was compelled to dispatch against the Armenians a punitive army led by the Byzantine general Sitas, who at the time was one of his two most talented and famous generals and who was married to Justinian's sister-in-law and the Empress Theodora's sister. The Armenian rebel army led by the three houses made up of a total of some, I don't know, 10 to 20,000 soldiers against a Byzantine contingent of some 20 to 30,000. Sitas was the was to great extent cautious of the Armenian army. Good on you. Be careful of them. Earlier in 527, Sitas along with Belisarius were defeated in the territory of Marspatin of Armenia by the forces of brothers Nerse and Harahat Kamsarakans. So they had actually uh, tasted yeah, yeah. A little oh, bit yeah. Of that battle. Be so, careful, yeah. buddy. Yeah. Don't come near us. Sitas was killed in 539 when he faced the Armenian rebel army of Vasak Mamikonyan and Emperor Justinian was forced to send another Byzantine general, Buzes. The latter resorted to treachery when it came to dealing with his foes. While inviting the Armenian rebels to suppo- uh, for supposed talks, Buzes killed the father of Artavan Arshakuni. Hovanes Arshakuni, while Hovanes' son-in-law, Vasak Mamikonyan, barely escaped the trap and was forced to take refuge across the border in the territory of Mars Patin of Armenia. Well, what the name like... What an uh, interesting scene. With a name like Buzes, (laughs) 
What do you expect? Yeah, yeah but like, what an yeah. interesting scene, Seriously, right? Like, right? Like how you know Vosak barely escaped. I mean, uh, how does he barely escape? That's what I'm trying to figure yeah, like out. How like, how do you get? Like, how do you how do you escape like Roman legionnaires and whatnot? Yeah, right? Yeah, it's crazy. Well, the the Persian uh, the Persian Shah Osrov the first promised Armenian rebels support in May of 544, as the Armenian Marsbonet launched a military campaign against the Byzantines. Unlike in the previous periods when the Nahars fought against the Sasanians after the loss of their hereditary rights in Byzantine Armenia, the Nahars showed a more pro-Sasanian position. I mean, you can't blame them. Since in the Persian-controlled part of Armenia, the Nahars still continued to enjoy self-autonomy and their feudal inheritance rights, including the passing of the land possession from father to son, were left intact. I mean, that's a big deal, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I can't blame them. Nope. Perhaps the Nahars hoped to have the Byzantine part, which included the western portions of Armenia, united with the Armenian uh, Marsbatine, uh, which was made up of eastern and central portions of Armenia. Thus, the right of the Nahars, uh, actually, thus the rights of the Nahars, uh, terminated by Justinian, would be automatically restored under the jurisdiction of the Marsbanet. So, you know, I, I mean, too much back and forth. Yeah. That's yeah. just now, now you're getting a taste of all the politics, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And you, 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 I mean, when you listen to this, you start asking questions as to like, what's going on here? Yeah. The back and forth to back and forth. You're giving them power, then you're taking it away. Then you're splitting up, up into first Armenia, eighth Armenia, ninth Armenia. And then now all of a sudden... It's you take that away, then you give it back, then then this traitor guy comes in, and in a way, honestly, it's exhausting. Oh yeah, and, it is. And it's, it it sucks how this politics has. I mean, you're talking about, you know, I mean, ages we're, ago, we're living through it personally we, in in present day. Yeah, but at I the know. same time, when you try to wrap your mind around what was going on back then, mm -hmm. it's yeah. difficult without the details and having to live through it. We yeah. only got so much detail to work off of, yeah. but. Um, it's still kind of exhausting to think about. Like even going through the notes the last couple of days, like it's, you're trying to kind of stop and think, it's like, hold on, this guy did this to this guy and then they took away this to that. What? Hold yeah. on. You know? Well, this is just part one. Yeah, so. and this is just part one. <laughs> <sighs> All right. That same year, Shah Khosrov conquered the large and important Syrian city of Antioch, which we've heard many times before which at this time had a population of around half a million. Khosrov deported the population to a newly built city in Persian Mesopotamia named Veh Antioch Khosrov. As a result, Antioch lost as many as 300,000 people and would never recover to its former glory. However, after two years of fighting during the ongoing Sasanian Byzantine conflict in 542, Justinian was able to convince the Armenian leaders who had joined Khosrov to put down their arms in exchange, promising to restore their feudal rights throughout the Byzantine Armenia, as well as high ranking positions within the Byzantine court. It is not a coincidence that after this, the Armenian nobility started to play a more important role in the Byzantine capital of Constantinople, and was destined less than 70 years later in 610 to establish the Heraclean dynasty, which we're going to get to, which became one of the greatest dynasties of the Byzantine Empire. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's funny how uh, no matter what, we're always in the middle and we're playing tug of war between yeah. the Persians and the Romans. It's constant back and forth. Promise from this guy, we're there. Promise from this guy, we're there. Until we finally end up getting our own empire or, well, you know, whatever. But it's always been like that. It's always been like that. I mean, everything we've read so far and we've talked about it from episode one to now, it's the same tug of war over and over and uh, over. And that's and because we're I'm, always in our... In, uh, yeah, and I'm going to say, look where we were always geographically located. That, well, yeah, hence the, you know, it's, it's the theater of that the... Is, that is the number, in my opinion, the number one thing because yeah. you had conquerors from the West, you have conquerors from the South, you had conquerors from the East. Yep. Shoot, you even had some sort of conquerors from the North. Yeah. Weaker ones, 
nonetheless. Yeah. But it we were always in the way. Yeah. Forever. Even yeah. with like the even with non-Armenian individuals who let's say I've gotten into conversations with in the past before we even started this whole thing years ago. Yeah. The most obvious answer for anybody, why have Armenia always been back and forth, back and forth, back? Look where we are. Yeah. Smack dab in the middle of the Silk Road. Done. Yeah. That's it. Unfortunate. Yeah. It's unfortunate. That's it. Well, this it's fortunate and unfortunate. It's, well, it's well, unfortunate in the sense of that we kept well, getting, if, you know. Well, if, we, if it was, a, if let's say, and again, this isn't, I'm not knocking on it, but if we were a powerful enough empire from, from centuries, uh, millennia ago, and yeah. we maintain that, yeah. right, that would have been a different story. But obviously the ebbs and flows of time and yeah. power shifts, Roman Empire, Persian Empire, you know, Assyrians, things push, pull, tug, left and right. Watch the mic. God, Mike. <laughs> better much better well um that was part one um i hope everybody enjoyed this uh episode this is uh this is something new guys i don't know if you like it like i said we are this is this is pre-recorded but we are kind of live in the chats with you guys uh for those of you who will be listening to this on our you know podcast platform doesn't matter but if you want to watch the video you can always go on youtube and see it um uh, i hope you guys enjoyed this read um again this is about the Armenian history in the sixth century uh we're gonna do this again with part two um uh, we're still waiting for a couple of guests to confirm on the lives for possibly next week and the week after that but if those don't come through we usually don't announce it until we have a confirmation but if they, those don't come through then we'll definitely do another one like this with part I, two i definitely like talking about history yeah yeah, yeah. no we enjoy this we I have fun this. you know yeah this, i love this, this. Is the best part i'm so, not taking it no. away from our lives i no. like our lives but yeah. this is this is this makes yeah. me wake up in the morning yeah um so uh everyone in, in the live chat that joined us thank you so much uh, uh we're Hopefully we answered some questions for you and you guys enjoyed it. But um, yeah, anything you want to mention before we call it a day? No, no. no. Um, no. Well, maybe. I does. Did YouTube remove the unlike button or dislike button? No, but definitely hit like, uh, mm. subscribe and share. Please share, share, share. Very important. We want to get our subscription over a thousand people um you know please let people know about us we have a lot of episodes coming up a lot of great live shows um uh, follow us on instagram uh, for all the posts that we do follow us on facebook uh we're on twitter but eh, who really uses twitter but um and then uh what else uh yeah go to our shop if you guys want to support us please order the sculptures we appreciate everybody we're who's, getting the statues yeah. we're getting the statues yeah. rolling in bronze yeah, the bronze ones are available now. Uh, I even want one. It's funny how we still yeah, don't we have still, one. Yeah, we still don't have one. Um, <laughs> we but, really don't. Yeah, I want to mention, I, I think uh, maybe next episode, episode after that, we might announce the the our our sixth sculpture. Our sixth sculpture. Yeah, yeah. Sixth I, should, sculpture. I, should have that, I should have that done um, this weekend. Those of you, uh, we should. And more artwork. Yeah, uh, well, those of you who who ordered the Ashken, you guys saw that we got the we finally got the version. They're on their way, so those will be shipped out. God, she we came are, out good. Yeah, that look, it's it's beautiful. It's yeah, beautiful. She came out really good. Um, Gomitas, Andranik, those are those of you who pre-ordered. Pe please be patient. They are in production. As soon as we get the first batch of twenty-five, they'll start going out. Uh, well, I've mentioned before we make these in 25 batches because it takes a long time yeah, each they piece, do. you know. They so do. by the time the turnaround time again, I know we've talked about it before. Yeah. By the time it gets out of the 3D printer, goes to production, by the time they pump out a certain number, yeah, there is a there's a certain turnaround time. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, you know. So uh, besides that, um, again, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. As we always say, uh, respect one another, love one another. And until the next episode, take care of yourselves. Thank <laughs> you.